a word about our sponsor. Vasken Matnu Dumoli LLP is one of the world's leading uh, international business law and litigation firms. It has over 700 lawyers, and the firm has offices in Canada, UK, South Africa, and United Kingdom. The practice includes every sector of business, industry, and government. Their excellence and sector ex expertise, integrity, and ethics have earned them numerous prestigious accolades. In the first half of the session, we will have Arun lead the way, followed by Thomas. Arun Krishnamurti is an associate in business law section in the firm's Toronto office. He has a broad corporate commercial practice with an emphasis on technology. Outside of the technology area, he's been involved in a variety of transactions, including mergers, acquisition, restructuring, public-private partnerships, and financings. He's been involved in the firm startup and entrepreneurial service initiative as well, working with startups, early stage companies, and entrepreneurs in a number of areas, including crowdfunding. He is the current editor of the Information Technology and E-Commerce Newsletter, published by the Ontario Bar Association, and a member of Information Technology and E-Commerce Section Executive. Arun also sits as a director on the board of South Asian Bar Association of Toronto. Please help me welcome Arun to the conversation. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's always nice to come up after that, but I always feel a little bit uh, shy, like I can't live up to the, the, the nice words everyone said. Um, so I'm going to try and make this a little bit more informal in case any of you have questions. Uh, feel free to sort of ask them now, or you can save them towards the end if you prefer. Um, I may you know, go a little bit faster or something like that, depending on the nature of, of where we're focusing our attention. Um, I know since we're focused a little bit more on social uh, entrepreneurship and social enterprise, if you have questions focused on, on how uh, what I'm saying applies to that area, uh, feel free to ask them, because I'm going to come at this from more of the sort of basic legal angle, but I'm happy to give you some examples or, or give you a little bit more on a topic if you find that that's helpful. Um, so when looking to try and decide what vehicle to use to create your business, um, there's no kind of set rule of thumb to how you choose to do it. It's really dependent on the scenario, um, the circumstances in which you operate, how early you are, and the type of business that you're in. Um, there are three main types that we really look at. You can have a sole proprietorship, which is really, you know, I can start one today, like you pick up and start a business right now, more or less your sole proprietorship. Uh, there's a partnership, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail, and that's generally when there's, there's more than one of you doing that same thing. Um, and the third is a corporation, which is uh, a separate legal entity that provides you with a, a certain amount of flexibility and, and advantages, and sometimes, some disadvantages as well. Uh, so most businesses that we find or that we've dealt with have evolved over time and often go through one or more or all three of these types of vehicles. Um, and again, there's no right way to do it. There's advantages, particularly on the cost in the cost area, um, to each of them as we go along. So as I mentioned, the sole proprietorships, the, the simplest form of, of corporate vehicle business organization that we'll talk about today. The main point about this is that a sole proprietor is the sole owner of that business. So you get, you own, uh, assuming that it's of course you that we're talking about, uh, own all of the business, all the assets, and unfortunately all of the liabilities. The bonus is that you get to keep all the profits that come out of the business. The downside is you take all the losses that could come out of this business. You, because of the nature of the way this is structured, it's not a separate entity. It's just you, so you're personally responsible for any debts that your business run up. Um, that makes it a little bit more uh, of a risky proposition, but it's often easier uh, for people as they're just starting out, particularly because you have all the autonomy in the situation. As the business owner, you get to make all the decisions. You don't have to consult anybody. You can just do more or less what you want, provided that it's within the confines of the law. Um, and because of that, it, it's very, Flexible. It gives you the maximum amount of flexibility that you can get from a from a business vehicle. There's a note about tax at the bottom. I'm going to leave all the tax comments to, to my colleague Tom, who will be speaking after me. I don't want to steal any of this thunder. So this is just to give you a, a quick sort of visual snapshot of, of many of the things I just mentioned. B 
the advantages, particularly for a sole, uh, sole proprietorship, is they're the cheapest way to start your business. If you're starting out with a great idea and you don't really know where to go yet, this is often the way to go because you can start getting your business into production without dealing with a lot of regulation, without a lot of overhead costs, and again, complete decision-making freedom. The down, one of the downsides that I, I didn't mention before is that it's very difficult to raise any capital. Um, it's hard to get an investment as a sole proprietorship because uh, you can't really, you can't issue shares, you can't give them a real cut of your business in the same way. Um, and because the nature of the liability is unlimited, if an investor joins you, um, which I'll get into in a second, you're more likely to become a partnership, and in which case, they're still, their personal assets are also at risk. So you'll, it'll be hard to find someone who's willing to sort of put in their money and take on the risk unless they absolutely believe in that idea or you have an incredibly charming pitch. Partnerships, uh, which is a second vehicle that we discussed. Um, the technical definition of it is a relationship that subsists where two or more persons carry on business in common with a view to a profit. So the key to this is the view to a profit. You don't actually have to make a profit, but you have to sort of more or less be trying. This is very helpful when you're trying to exploit the, the expertise of, of a couple of people. Um, if you have you know, friends or colleagues or, or business partners who you really want to participate in this business and you want them to be a part of this, uh, it's a method to give them a stake in the business without uh, going into the formal stake of, of setting up a corporation. Um, you keep the flexibility uh, and the overhead cost low again. So this is a point we often see where you've set your business, you've done your business for a couple of years, and you're looking to bring someone on board to help you grow. Whether if you're a technology company, this is often the point where you bring in someone who's maybe a like a technical co-lead, someone who's you know more on the engineering side. If you're the business person, or vice versa, someone who's there to complement you in the skills that you may not have uh, to the same degree. The risk with partnerships, of course, is that they can be formed inadvertently. They can be formed not quite by accident, but a little bit. Um, the way the law looks at this is they look at the intention of the parties, they look at the circumstances of the situation, and they look at the nature of your business. So if you are operating a sole proprietorship and you have someone going out there and you know making deals for you and trying to help drum up business, the law may look upon you as a partnership. If this individual is holding himself out there, or herself, out there with the ability to make deals or agree to terms or do anything like that, um, then you run into the risk of the law looking at you as a partnership, which changes your relationship with your business and your relationship with that person. So the way this works, and one of the things I just mentioned, is that the Partnership Act, uh, in Ontario particularly, sets out the rights and duties between you and your other partners. So you own the business in common at that point. And you're therefore responsible for the profits, the loss, the debts, everything jointly. Um, so as someone who's coming into a partnership or coming into a business, if, some, if a friend of yours asks you to help out with the business, this is something to be aware of because you may inadvertently find yourself overly involved and therefore at risk for any debts that may run up. And again, this is not a separate legal entity. So this is both of you, or three of you, or four of you, uh, putting yourself out there personally and putting your personal assets at risk. And again, so the relationship between the partners, you are obligated to act with a duty, uh, with a duty of good faith between yourself and, and your partner. So you can't go up there uh, and try and find ways to sort of uh, get around them. You kind of you have to keep them advised of what you're up to. You're supposed to share in the decisions with them. Uh, and you can't do anything that will conflict, so you can't you know, do anything, make decisions on behalf of the partnership that would benefit you personally, but not the partnership as a whole. So the advantages, as, as I, may, I might have mentioned, um, is that it's very quick and easy to, to set up a partnership. You don't need to do a formal declaration unless you want to operate under a specific name or, or create a, a limited partnership, which is something I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Um, this is a little bit easier to gain access to capital only because you can formally declare someone to be a partner of yours. Um, you can admit them to the partnership. The benefit of this, obviously, is that you it's a slight increase in your opportunity to bring other people on board, whether it's for skills, 
uh, whether it's for their connections, their networking, or for their money. The disadvantage is, is that you now lose the autonomy that I mentioned with the sole proprietorship. You're now responsible for making decisions in common with at least one other person, if not more. So that can sometimes lead to tension. And one of the reasons that we always highly recommend creating what we call what is called a partnership agreement. You're not required to have one necessarily, but if you don't have one, then the defaults under the Partnership Act come into play. So this sets up certain requirements as to how you're supposed to treat each other, what happens if one of you chooses to leave, dies, is incapacitated. Um, both a sole proprietorship and a partnership, and this is something I forgot to mention before, uh, they don't continue after the individual ceases to be part of it. So if you're a sole proprietorship and you set up a business and you get sick and you can no longer operate your business or you pass away, the business dies with you. With a, with a partnership, it's, it's a similar circumstance. If you don't set it up to address this issue through a partnership agreement, if one of the partners leaves the partnership, the partnership dissolves and the business is done. So that becomes a little bit contentious as well as making decisions because you have to balance your interest against that of another person. As we've all seen, as anyone who's ever seen sort of any sort of business movie knows, um, business is the greatest way to make friends, but also the quickest way to, to make an enemy. Um, only because at some point along the line, frequently, your business interests diverge or your personal interests diverge. And this is a particular risk when it comes to uh, a social enterprise or social entrepreneurship idea. Because there may be, it may be as simple as the organization or the goal that you choose to support, you now want to go in different directions, whether you were focused on relieving poverty, and you now want to be environmentally focused, if you two can't agree on that, then that may spell the end of your partnership. If I hire, say, a business development manager or a sales manager who goes out there and does my work, can you come back and say, okay, now I'm a partner because of what you mentioned earlier? Uh, the risk is only when the, uh, the agreement that you have with that individual doesn't spell it out. So the, the, the best way to avoid that is, uh, assuming you hire them as, a, as an employee, is to have the terms of the employment agreement spell out how the, your relationship between you two is, is to be is to be uh, addressed because then there's rules about how they're able to hold what what in, in the manner in which they're able to hold themselves out to potential clients because uh, the risk is really where they come out and sort of represent themselves as a partner of the business and say you know you know our business is doing really well you should you should join us or, or take a look at this opportunity whereas they can say you know uh, it, especially if you set it up so that you can clearly prove that this person is never supposed to do that, you have a lot more recourse and can protect yourself a lot better. There are three or four people that are in partners in a business and they're just uh, you know declared as partners without any particular percentage. And then if financial issues arise, is that uh, divided equally among the partners or can one partner say, you know what, I'll take the brunt of that or whatever? Um, the partner could, if you found one who is very generous, but otherwise the, the responsibility is with, with each and every one of them. Um, so what frequently will happen, particularly say if you <coughs> get yourself into a problem where there's a, like a debt owing, um, the person who's owed the debt will usually come after the partner with the deepest pockets, okay. uh, but may try and collect some amount of money from each of, each of the partners. Um, so while technically it's assigned broadly, the, the practical implication of it is that the uh, the richest or the most well-off partner tends to bear the brunt of the risk. They'll go with cash. Yeah, Ten it, it's just, it's. I mean, as a lawyer, not that I would ever do this, but uh, the the practical reality is that you pursue the, the individuals who are likely to pay uh, in whatever percentages you can get from each of them. A limited partnership, uh, what I mentioned before, is a form of partnership that allows some additional protection for partners. So in this, you have a general partner, which is uh, an individual or a company who has unlimited liability for the partnership, and then you have a number of limited partners. So this allows the limited partners to protect themselves from the liabilities of the partnership, so they're only responsible for the amount of money or resources that they put into it, but they also cannot take uh, an active role in managing or participating in the business. So this is where you kind of get the, the idea of, of people who they call silent partners frequently. Uh, people who are, are there to be present and may be there um, to casually discuss things with very occasionally, but you have to be very careful of the method in which you do this. But they can't take an active role in the company. And again, the general partner is still not protected. 
Uh, a joint venture is, is sort of a, a hybrid of a number of these uh, opportunities that we'll talk about both before and after. And it's where you sort of have a couple of people come together, whether they be individuals or corporations, generally to participate on a specific project. So you see this a lot in you know, resource development, um, sometimes in manufacturing or in technology where uh, a couple of companies will come together or individuals will come together to try and develop a particular product where their expertise can be combined. Um, so whether that's you know, an app or you know, a new form of water bottle or whatever it is, um, this is, it, it's, it's a very narrow focus and generally dies after the project is over. So, so it's not necessarily a specific type of organization. It doesn't have independent um, rights to it. But the, the way we do this is always through a contract, as most of the things that we, we try and discuss between the relationships between you and another person. From a legal perspective, it's always better to have something on paper. Um, and in particular in this case, because you want to set out who's responsible for what portions of the, of the actions, whether it's who's responsible for doing the actual work and how much each person's responsible for funding and you know who's doing the marketing and any of that kind of stuff. You just want to clearly spell out exactly what the role of responsibilities are because otherwise you run into the risk of people, uh, of miscommunication. Corporations, which is sort of you know, the very base premise of, of, of this presentation. Um, this, is, this is the one that I think offers the most protection to you as individuals, um, and particularly to your investors. So it's just, it, this is uh, an entity that's completely separate under the law. A co corporation's able to own property, enter into its own agreements, you can sue and be sued under the name of the corporation. And it has most of the rights and powers uh, of a natural person. Not all of them, but, but more than you would think. So as an owner of the corporation, as a shareholder of the corporation, uh, you are completely distinct from that corporation. So you, unless you're a director in very specific circumstances, don't have personal liability for the actions of the corporation. If you form a corporation, you develop your product, and your product, product unfortunately, doesn't do very well, um, and you run up a bunch, a bunch of debts, then you, as a shareholder, are not at risk, other than the amount of money that you put in and the blood and sweat and tears that you put in until that point. So this, as I mentioned before, this is an instance where the entity can, can continue after you no longer are with it, whether it's because you've chosen to exit the corporation, or whether you've passed away, or been incapacitated, or you know whatever the circumstances may be. Um, this is especially helpful if you want that idea to continue. There are situations in which you may not, in which you may want uh, to guard yourself against the idea of, of uh, someone being able to force you out of your business, which is something that we can touch on a little bit later uh, in the nature of a shareholder's agreement. But uh, otherwise, for, the most for most people, they want the business to continue to continue to grow, even if they choose to no longer be a part of that business. Um, Not-for-profit corporations, and this is a little bit kind of a hybrid, uh, touching on the social enterprise, it's a bit of misleading because under the, the new acts, not-for-profit co corporations enjoy many of the same protections of a for-profit corporation, including the ability to actually make a profit uh, in certain circumstances. Um, similar to uh, regular for-profit corporations, you can be incorporated provincially or federally, and uh, the members, uh, in this case, which is equivalent to the shareholders of, of a uh, corporation, are protected from the liabilities of that corporation. Now, this is, just because you're a not-for-profit corporation doesn't mean that you're a charity. It doesn't mean that you're a non-profit organization under the, the Income Tax Act, which, which my colleague Todd will touch on in, in just a moment, or a few minutes. Uh, we've, the, the Act, especially in Ontario, is structured such that corporations will either be a public benefit corporation or a non-public benefit corporation. And this, uh, a, a public benefit corporation is, again, broken down into two subgroups, which is uh, a charitable corporation, which is uh, determined under the common law, and then there's other corporations which re receive certain amounts of public donations. The one major difference between the two, and one that is important to consider if you're looking, uh, particularly from a social entrepreneurship angle and how to structure your business, is that as a director of the, co of, of the organization, you cannot be paid, um, especially, you can't be paid in the acting as a director, and you can't be paid as acting in other, in other 
uh, services for the corporation. So you really, it's, it, what that practically means is that you cannot be both an employee of a nonprofit corporation and a director of that nonprofit corporation. As a corporation, for-profit corporation, you can be both. And especially when you're starting out with one or two of you, you probably have to be. Um, overall, um, all of both, so both cor for-profit corporations, not-for-profit corporations, are governed uh, under applicable legislation, both federally or provincially. And because of that, there are certain obligations that are put upon you under that law. The corporate government's idea can be applied to partnerships as well because it's this duty of acting in good faith both towards your shareholders, your partners, your business colleagues, etc. And you are, as a director of that corporation, responsible for acting that way. You have to be very careful as a director of the corporation not to put yourself into a conflicting situation. Same as under the Partnership Act. You cannot act, the general rule of thumb is you cannot act in a way that benefits you personally for the specific reason of it benefiting you personally. You have to act in whatever is the best interest of the company. Now, uh, some of you may have heard of this, uh, of, of a thing called a B Corp, which is something that will be touched on a little bit later as well, which is uh, a method of trying to put, to guide a corporation into considering more than just the, stake, the shareholders into broader stakeholders and the community, etc. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So the fiduciary duties on the directors uh, which is sort of what I've, more or less what I've been talking about, is you have to make sure that you're A, qualified to do this, because the under, under the for-profit legislation, you're responsible for exercising the care, diligence, and skill of someone who would be a reasonably prudent person. So this is not the highest bar in the world, um, but at the same time, it's something that you have to be aware of, because you cannot make decisions strictly because you want to. Uh, you have to be careful to, to, to test yourself and make sure that someone else in your situation would make a similar decision. So this test has both subjective and objective components, which makes it very frustrating for people to um, often do this test by themselves. The objective test is you know, someone who has your skills and experience, kind of how they would act in the circumstances. And then the other subjective test is sort of common sense. Um, so obviously, as a corporation, you cannot do something that way. You cannot actively, you know, for example, make your corporation break the law. That's a big no-no. Um, even if it's something, you know, so there's no such thing as sort of like civil disobedience for corporations. But you can have a corporation take political action if you want, or involve itself in particular campaigns. Shareholders agreements, which I touched on very briefly earlier, this is the method under the for-profit legislation for A, controlling your uh, risk and exposure, um, both amongst you know, your relationship with the company, your relationship with other shareholders, and your relationship with the directors. So this deals with things like uh, procedural matters, such as, you know, when you're setting meetings, the process for setting meetings, notice, and that sort of thing. Um, any obligations on the company, what they have to offer you. Uh, restrictions on each other for how, whether or not you can sell your shares or transfer your shares. And preemptive rights, which is uh, an example of something that is helpful if you invest in a company earlier and you want to protect yourself from being diluted later on down the road. Um, so the procedure matters things like how often the board has to have meetings. This is very helpful when you are uh, all very busy, for example, uh, when you're starting your company off and you want to make sure that you understand the process for, for when, the, when the meetings will have to take place so that you can hold the company accountable if the directors choose not to do that. And the procedure for electing officers and directors. So the covenants of the corporation, this is where you sort of protect yourself as a director. Um, if you're a shareholder and a director, you protect yourself uh, from liability by implementing insurance. And so this is an obligation on the company to protect the directors and to purchase insurance on their behalf. Um, the restrictions are, are typical that you know you can't sell uh, without the approval of the other founding members, or you can sell um, if, for example, you fall sick, you have to sell to the other founding members, things like that. Um, it may also be that it deals with situations, what happens uh, you know, with spousal rights, I mean, that kind of stuff, because you know, if, if you're uh, a married person under the law, there are certain rights that your spouse gains to your property, which you will address, typically address in these types of agreements just to make sure that everything is covered. Uh, preemptive rights, again, this is what I, was, uh, what I mentioned about the ability to purchase, to participate in future offerings, so that if, you're a if you've invested in a company earlier, the company wants to 
issue new shares, raise new money, you as a shareholder have the right to also participate in that just to make sure that you Question. You mentioned the shareholders. Can the children become shareholders of the family? I think they can. Um, is there an age restriction? Well, yes. So the, the way it works is um, typically in this, you would address the nature of what happens to the shares after the fact, whether they pass to a trust, for example. Um, you typically, as part of the succession plan, I'm not sure if you're going to touch on any of this time or not. Oh, but I can answer some, uh, some questions as oh, they come up. Okay. Um, so the nature of how we're, I don't know if you want to touch on this now, maybe the, the, the succession plan aspect of it, of how it will pass down. Okay, in any event, so there, 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 there are tools you can use to determine what will happen to your assets after you pass away. And so provided that it's addressed both in the shareholders agreement, so you know that you don't have to get rid of your shares, for example, if you pass away, um, you can set it up such that if your kids are minors, for example, uh, the shares pass through a trust, which then passes to them upon reaching a certain age, for example, or someone you know is able to hold them in, in trust for this in their children until that point. Um, it's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're talking about here, only because it's a little bit more specific in the estate planning. Uh, but there are methods in which you can ensure that your shares, if you're a shareholder, pass along to members of your family or your children or your children's children, etc. And um, another question, can a single person open corporation? Yes. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> Yes, the, the caveat to that is, in Ontario, for example, you you can be the most the sole shareholder and sole director of the company, so you as an individual can have a company, but you have to be, in order to sit on the board, you have to be a resident of Canada. Um, to the extent that you're not, um, which may or may not be an issue, uh, you may have to find another individual who will sit on the board, but does not necessarily have to be a shareholder. So you can still control the company, in terms of controlling the shares, but you may have to expand the board in order to fit the residency requirements, which are sort of assessed based on the nature of, a, of the circumstances. Uh, but yes, you, you as an individual can have your own company. Uh, excuse me, I, I didn't get the answer to the first question. I, I have a son, and I would like my son to have a share, my preferred share in my corporation. I'm setting up a company today, he is 12 years old. Can I do it? Not as such. You can't give it to him now. Uh, you can give, you can you can issue it to be held in trust for him to, until he returns a certain age because he is unable to do anything with it uh, until that point. I think you can. I, I doubt if it's your company. I don't know anyone's going to have an issue with it. Okay. Um, the practical answer again, it, like it depends on the nature of the company and depends on the people you're dealing with. Uh, sort of a closer analysis done, and so you know that's something that we can help with um, with a little bit more detail, because it depends on sort of the nature of, of what you're up to, and the nature of the company you're choosing, and the legislation you're incorporated under. Uh, but it's something that we can look into happily. Uh, do all of our shareholders have to be Canadian? No. no. Okay, so you no. Can have some that are? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, there are, which I think are now relaxed, but depending on the nature of the, the industry you're in, there are specific rules, mm -hmm. but for the most part, like a day-to-day -day, like OBCA corporation, like an Ontario corporation, um, your director, a certain percentage of your directors have to be Canadian, but um, the shareholders can be from anywhere. I have a question. Uh, are all the uh, corporations publicly traded? No. 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 Um, the vast majority of them will be private. Um, it's a rather lengthy and expensive process to, to go public, but the advantage of that is obviously you then have the ability to you know, list your shares on, on a stock exchange and then sort of freely trade and issue securities with certain types of disclosure that sort of other steps involved. But it's, it's a little bit easier to access more money if you are public. It's just typically not done until you're a certain size because it's very expensive. Lots of questions. Um, it's, thank you. So can um, partners or whatever type of agreement that you decide to set up, can they do that themselves or does the lawyer have to get involved? Um, corporations, we typically, in, in any event, obviously, you could do it on your own. Um, to the extent that you're looking, for example, for a partnership, uh, to have a partnership agreement drafted, mm -hmm. my suggestion, and in complete honesty, and this is not sort of a plug for myself, but I, I would suggest have, consulting a lawyer only because you want to make sure that you covered all of the issues that could arise. 
Um, the risk is, because you know, there are a number of internet resources and things that will offer template agreements, but depending on the nature of the type of business you're in and where you're represented, for example, if your partners are in different jurisdictions, you know, you're, like you're setting up a business with someone in BC, for example, you just want to make sure that you've covered off um, certain issues or things that happen and, and things that you may not have thought of. So uh, that, that could differ in each province? Uh, there are certain requirements that could, for example, and uh, I haven't looked at the BC legislation, yeah. uh, at least not in some time, but there could be particular requirements under that jurisdiction which may govern or may take precedence or may affect your rights you know, between each other. So you just want to make sure that you've, you've at least grasped the risk, um, which is something that a lawyer can do without doing too much more. They're able to sort of point out uh, the major issues, even if they don't do any writing for you or do any drafting of the agreement, they can say, this is what your agreement's missing or this is something typically I would include whether you do it is up to you, but at least you go in fully armed with the knowledge of what you're missing. And are corporate holders allowed, or they are supposed to be physical persons? Uh, cor corporate shareholders are allowed. Uh, uh, and what about partners uh, in partnership? No, the partnership can't hold um, shares in the name of the partnership, uh, unless it's a limited partnership, I believe. Um, no, I'm sorry. The, someone, someone is able to hold shares on behalf of the partnership. So if you're in a limited partnership, for example, mm -hmm. the general partner can act on its behalf and could in theory hold shares on, on its behalf. But typically, we'd see, in, in the case of partnership, partners hold shares individually in a greater corporation. Um, so you have the overall corporation. You wouldn't have a partnership that's a shareholder, but you'd have the two partners individually hold shares in that corporation. Does that answer your question? Uh, the, the fundamental difference. Uh, can everyone hear? There we go. Yeah. Uh, the fundamental difference between the, the partnership and the corporation is that the corporation is a separate legal entity. It's like a separate individual that owns things and can operate yeah. and can get sued and all these things. But a partnership is really just a construct of a an arrangement between two people. So when it gets down to it, it's, it always flows through that partnership to the and uh, to the individuals, whether it be corporate ownership or taxation, things like that. And the last question about directors: Is some, they are supposed to be physical person or corporate directors are allowed, allowed as well? No, directors have to be physical persons. Um, in the I have a question about the limited liability partnership. So limited partnership is something different when you have one general partner and one or two or more um, limited partners. And limited liability partnerships like uh, Fast and Martino, for example, can you tell a little more about those types of entities? Sure. Um, in brief, they're only permitted for certain types of professional. Um, it's not something that sort of uh, anybody can go and set up, but the, there's, a, there's, a, there's an act entry that prescribes the individuals who can who are eligible to form such a partnership, lawyers being one, accounts being one, I think architects are one. Um, beyond that, there's not, the advantage to that is that the, you are shielded from liability. Um, in much the same way that a limited partner is under a limited partnership, but the downside is it's not available to most people in most industries. In limited liability partnership, you are not personally liable, right? No. You're not. Okay, thank you. I had another question about you. Uh, if I want to have a professional corporation, which is also available, I understand, to either uh, lawyers, accountants, or something, but they want to set it up as a non profit, can I do it? I am not sure. Um, so, sorry, can you repeat? Okay, well, I, I want to form a corporation. Uh, not corporation, I want to have a company that does legal services as a non-profit or uh, accounting as a non-profit. So like legal aids, for example. Yeah. So I want to set up a non-profit corporation with possibly charitable status, which would have professionals offering legal services. And if I'm not a legal uh, professional myself, I cannot offer legal services. So I mean, uh, I understand it's kind of a... There's uh, the very strict restrictions on uh, lawyers acting uh, as a corporation. Uh, and so we have to get into the specifics of, of what you're looking for. If you're, you know, if you're funding uh, individuals' uh, legal services as a corporation, you can definitely be a nonprofit, and that can be a nonprofit purpose in, in funding 
the legal expense of, of individuals. If you're bringing on lawyers as part of the, the corporation, then it gets complex and the, the rules, I don't know, I wouldn't maybe call Yeah, in, in, in brief, well. if you're trying to do that, so the law society has rules about the, the way to set up a, corp a professional corporation. A lawyer acting for a nonprofit is able to act for that nonprofit, but to act for individuals outside of that is a different scenario. But legal aid somehow works. Yeah, but they're a government um, funded. Oh, I see. So I cannot set up a legal aid uh, like a charitable, non government funded agency. That's, that's what no, you'd have to go through Legal Aid Ontario for, to set up something like that here. There are clinics who are privately run and organized and operated through under the auspices of legal aid, but there's a separate pro like process for that that um, is very specific to the nature of, of that situation. Um, I think we might have time for one more. I apologize for running over. No, I was just going to thank for wonderful questions and asking you to proceed on, but let's go ahead. So if I set up a partnership or a sole partnership with the intention of becoming a corporation, say one year after, and in order to sort of keep costs low and keep it simplified, and then I, after that one year when I want to switch over to a corporation, how complicated is the process? Um, it's not particularly complicated so long as you and your partner still agree. Um, the, the, the basis is uh, you simply sign, a, there's a set of documents that we prepare, or you, know, you can have prepared, um, that involve sort of uh, a couple of signatures and application to the government to approve it. Um, if you're trying to get a name, like a particular brand name or a corporation name, then you have to run a search and do that process. But it's very, it's the same process as if you were um, incorporating uh, you know, normally, other than you have to make sure that the, any IP that you developed, any of these things are transferred over. And you know, I don't know what the sort of tax implications are, but in terms of assets, you want to make sure that the assets that you brought in, whether they be you know, furniture and office space and whatever, are all transferred to the name of the, of the corporation in order to join the protection. So like, if you have a lease, you want to make sure that's transferred over. So that's sort of a set of documents on the side, but it would be um, otherwise pretty simple. Um, so the benefit is, I guess now, uh, we've come to the end of, of my portion of the presentation. Uh, my colleague Tom Brook will, will come up and speak, and I think, oh sorry, I think we'll need to introduce him. Let's yeah. get some Thank you, Aaron. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, everyone, I have the honor of doing so. Um, so Thomas is, uh, is one of our associates in our tax group, uh, which means he's much smarter than I am and knows a lot about a very complex area. Um, he, his practice focuses both on domestic and international tax planning, uh, which is incredibly helpful. And he's worked with a, a, a number of different companies, both internationally and, and, and in Canada. He has experience dealing with the CRA and provincial tax authorities on both audit and dispute resolution matters. Uh, before he joined us, actually, uh, Thomas worked for a manufacturing company in China. Uh, so he's come from both a practical and, and very academic angle. Uh, Thomas, um, uh, I guess, has been here for a couple of years now, and, and I don't think there's much more to say other than um, welcome and thank you for, uh, for coming.